God's truth will prevail. His truth is marching on. Please take your Bibles and turn back to that passage in Acts chapter 22. Our focal ver verse is verse 28. I'll read verses 27 and 28 once more. Then the chief captain came and said unto him, Tell me, art thou a Roman? And he said, Yea. And the chief captain answered, With a great sum obtained I this freedom. And Paul said, But I was free born. Free born. What does it mean to be born free? Today we celebrate freedom. In particular, we gather with thanksgiving that we were born free. Paul understood the concept of being born free and all those political, legal, economic, judicial, and civil ramifications. Today we live in a country where we're all free born. But very few understand what that freedom entails, or from the liberal side of the aisle, how those freedoms apply to conservative positions, not merely liberal positions. Let me illustrate. The Apostle Paul found himself in the hands of the police state, about to be beaten, and exerted the full force of his Roman citizenship. In the short term, that is immediately, he escaped physical torture just because he was a Roman citizen. The centurion and the chief captain were also Roman citizens, but even the chief captain had had to pay for his citizenship. He said, with a great sum obtained I this freedom. But Paul was free born. Those of you who were born in the United States were also free born. Now some of you here today are in the same situation as the Roman centurion. You were born in another country. You had to be naturalized to become American citizens. It was a process that required time and energy and money. But those who were born free had all the rights of citizenship and the potential rights, such as voting. You couldn't vote when you were little Jacob's age, for example. He was born in the United States. Someday you'll be able to, to vote. So you have potential rights as well as instantaneous rights when you are free born. Just as soon as you were born, those things were yours. Now it's important to understand the specific freedom this is very important. We say, yeah, 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 he escaped getting beaten. But that's not the specific freedom that Paul was claiming when he announced his citizenship. Did you know there was a very specific freedom that is enshrined in our Declaration of Independence and that is enshrined in our Constitution that Paul was claiming as he said, I'm a Roman citizen and everybody ran away from him. What was the specific freedom that Paul was claiming when he announced his citizenship? Of course, the immediate threat was he escaped the severe beating, but that was not the underlying cause for which he was going to be examined by scourging. They said, we're gonna beat the truth out of this guy. We're gonna tell us in Latin or something that we can understand because remember he had been preaching in Hebrew I had no idea what he was saying how would you like to be stationed someplace in a country where you don't understand the language you'd never know what was going on around you and they could be mocking you like crazy and you wouldn't even know it so they're gonna find out why in the world this has all been going on because he was preaching in Hebrew and then the crowd went wild and they dragged him into the castle what was the underlying cause? If you examine the passage, the underlying cause was freedom of speech and freedom of religion. You see, Paul had been proclaiming the gospel as he stood on the stairs leading up into the Antonia Fortress. The Jewish mob wanted to stop his freedom of speech even if it meant killing him. 
You know, we're still fighting that same battle today here in the United States. I hope you follow what's going on. We have so much to praise God for during the month of June in this year. Over the last three weeks, praise God that the United States Supreme Court has just handed down three victories granting the rights of believers to exercise freedom of, spe of speech and freedom of expression in this great land. Are you aware of that? I know you've all got to be aware of uh, Masterpiece Cake Shop because, with Jack Phillips because I had stuck a big long article in the bulletin about that. But did you know that since then we've had two more cases that have given tremendous freedom of speech and expression in this great land? On June 4th, 2018, the Supreme Court of the United States handed down the Masterpiece Cake Shop decision stating clearly that Baker Jack Phillips could not be forced by the state to make a wedding cake celebrating a sodomite wedding, so-called wedding, in violation of his deeply held Christian convictions. And I put a full-length article in that decision in the bulletin. That was on June 4th. Then on Monday, June 25th, the United States Supreme Court sent the Arlene Flowers appeal back to the Washington State Supreme Court. It had been coming up on appeal and had been appealed to the United States Supreme Court. The United States Supreme Court sent that back. They didn't deny it. They sent it back to the Washington State Supreme Court out there on the West Coast, where all the, the land of the fruits and the nuts out there. They sent it back to the Washington State Supreme Court, and they commanded them to review that case in light of the Masterpiece Cake Shop decision. That case, Arlene Flowers, dealt with a woman named Baronella Stutzman. She was a florist who had refused to make special flower arrangements for a sodomite wedding and was sued for it. Now, she sold flowers to anybody. In fact, the person who sued her had often bought flowers at the shop, but he wanted her to make some special decorations to celebrate a sodomite so-called wedding. She refused, and so he sued her. She lost in the state courts in Washington and was faced with insanely heavy fines and the loss of her business. When Jack Phillips, the Christian baker, won his case at the U.S. Supreme Court, the implications were powerfully obvious for all cases in that category, that is, Christian business owners being forced to support a message that viciously violated their Christian consciences that marriage was designed by God only between one man and one woman. The U.S. Supreme Court, by sending that back to the Supreme Court of Washington, is forcing the state of Washington, their Supreme Court, forcing them to rewrite their opinion that violates the free speech of Mrs. Stutzman. Maybe you don't know about this last one yet. It only happened yesterday. Yesterday, July 1st, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down a bizarre California law that tried to force pro-life pregnancy research centers, June 30th, that should be because today is July 1st. Um, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down a bizarre California law that tried to force pro-life pregnancy resource centers to advertise for abortions. Now, some of you have been deeply involved in the pro-life movement. That's fantastic. One of my close friends actually went to jail for protesting out in front of a, an abortion clinic 25 or 30 years ago. Many people have gone to jail for protesting and saying, you know, you're murdering babies. And that's the truth. That's what abortion clinics do. They murder babies in the womb, the place that should be the safest location for a baby, his mother's womb, has more babies murdered there than are murdered after they are born. California said, we're really tired of you pro-life people. We hate your guts. We want to be able to kill as many babies in California as we can possibly kill. And because you keep counseling women and telling them not to have abortions, we're going to force you to advertise for abortions. And California passed a law saying that all the pro-life centers in California 
had to advertise for abortions. They had to have referral numbers up. They had to give counsel to them that, well, hey, if you want an abortion, instead of listening to us, you go down the street and, you know, pay Planned Parenthood to do it for you. Can you believe that? But yesterday, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down that law that tried to force the pro-life pregnancy resource centers to advertise for abortion. The case was entitled National Institute of Family and Life Advocates, or NIFLA, N-I-F-L-A, versus Becerra. It was again about the rights of Christians to speak freely for biblical values and not be forced to promote the murderous values of abortion. Elias Defending Freedom CEO Michael Ferris, who used to be the president of the Homeschool Legal Defense Association, now he is the, the president, the CEO of the entire Alliance Defending Freedom, stated, all three cases referenced above were argued by our friends at Alliance Defending Freedom. Michael Ferris issued the following statement about today's NIFLA decision, quote, no one should be forced by the government to express a message that violates their convictions, especially on deeply divisive issues and subjects such as abortion. In this case, the government used its power to force pro-life pregnancy centers to provide free advertising for abortion. The Supreme Court said that the government can't do that and that it must respect pro-life beliefs. Tolerance and respect for good faith differences of opinion are essential in a diverse society like ours. They enable us to coexist peacefully with one another. If we want to have freedom for ourselves, we have to extend it to others. Justice Clarence Thomas wrote the 5-4 majority opinion stating, quote, the people lose when the government is the one deciding which ideas should prevail. One of the attorneys for the New Jersey Family Policy Council named David French wrote in his brief, compelled speech is not the answer to cultural conflict. The court must not render professional second-class citizens with diminished constitutional rights. There are few state actions more repugnant to the conscience of sincere pro-life citizens than demanding that they advertise free or low-cost access to the deadly procedure they, pre procedure they work so mightily to oppose. They were trying to stop the speech of Christians who stand for life. Praise God that President Trump appointed Neil Gorsuch to replace deceased Antonin Scalia. Can you imagine what it would have been like if Hillary Clinton had become president of the United States? What kind of a Supreme Court justice would have been offered to replace him? How would this have gone? It was a 5-4 decision. One vote difference. Dear people, you should be praising God that you're right to proclaim and stand for the gospel is still protected even in a hostile society where the unbelieving pagans would like to close this church or at least confine the gospel proclamation to the four walls that you see around you here and not be allowed to promote it over the internet, not be allowed to promote it over the radio, not be allowed to promote it through the handing out of tracts with the church name and address on the back of it. Do you understand why we pray for those who are in authority over us? Thank you for those of you who prayed concerning those cases. I hope you are also aware that Justice Stephen Breyer has just announced his retirement Pray for President Trump as he appoints a replacement to the Supreme Court bench with the advice and consent of the Senate. He has appointed more judges to the federal bench in his first two years than any other president appointed during their entire administration and he's appoint appointing constitutionalists. People who believe in the original intent of the framers so that we might maintain our freedoms. 
The Jewish crowd there at the foot of the Antonia Fortress, standing in the temple courtyard, looking up at the Apostle Paul, wanted to stop his free speech. They didn't want him to have the opportunity to declare and defend himself. Later on, when they demand that he be put to death, they're told it's not the way in which the Romans do things to condemn a man to death without allowing him first to stand before his accusers and present his side of the case and have the other side presented before him and then an impartial judiciary make a decision. That's in the founding documents of our country. It's based on biblical truth. The Judaizers were not only those who opposed the Apostle Paul in the courtyard beneath the Antonia Fortress, but they later, when they couldn't stop him, they joined him kind of thing. They crept into the church. They tried to pervert the gospel of Christ from inside the walls of the church when they couldn't stop it by the outside laws of the government. That's what the whole book of Galatians is dealing with. The specific issue with which Paul was dealing there demanded by the Judaizers that the church should require circumcision. Let's just twist their gospel a little bit. If we can twist it a little bit, we can make it politically correct. The study of Galatians reveals that some required circumcision for salvation, some required circumcision for sanctification. However, the passage in Galatians is one of the key passages in the scripture that sets out the overarching principles of true Christian liberty. What it is and what it's not. Liberty is certainly an appropriate theme for this week as we remember the freedom that God has granted us here in the United States. We're about to celebrate American Independence Day. It's with grateful thanksgiving that we as United States citizens look back to 1776 and the establishment of our country as an independent nation. The liberals want independence for themselves. They don't want independence or freedom for anybody who disagrees with their political agenda. The principle that Thomas Jefferson laid down was, you know, I may not agree with what you say, but I'll defend to the death your right to say it. That's been completely reversed by the liberals. They will only defend the things they believe in. And so when a conservative gets up to speak on a college campus, they try to drown him out with shouts, or they try to boycott it, or they try to close down the campus. They did that with Ann Coulter out in California, and she sued him, and she won. The university had given her the permission to the conservative group on campus for her to speak, and then they said, well, it's for security reasons. We can't ever speak because there'll be too many riots. Riots by whom? By the left wing who want to stop the free speech of those who preach the truth. They love all the freedoms they have and their immoral freedoms to marry whoever they want. You'll probably get it in the bulletin in the next couple of weeks, but did you know that there's been a judge who has just ruled that a polyamorous relationship is okay, even though polygamy is not permitted, but that on the birth certificate of a baby that is born to this threesome, all three parents, two men and a woman, they're not married, but they live together, that they can put the name of all three of them. Not going to do genetic testing of the baby to see who's the dad. They're going to put the name of both men and the woman on the birth certificate. The liberals love that. They love the left-wing stuff that crushes biblical morality. But they don't want you to tell the gospel to anybody. They don't want you to be free to stand up for what is right. You know, they wouldn't have the freedom in this country. They did, unless the founding fathers had given us the Second Amendment. Just think about this. The War of Independence would never have happened if there was gun control. You wouldn't be free today. You see, there are a lot of things that are implied in this. We have the political freedoms that we have because there were Christian men and women who stood for the right 
to proclaim the truth no matter what anybody said. I think you'll enjoy the film tonight. It's actually on a junior high level, so it has a little bit of humor in it. And uh, the guy who's taking it to all the sites is driving around in a big Hummer. Um, but uh, it'll tell you about John Adams and Abigail Adams and John Quincy Adams. You'd be amazed at all the Christian things that John Quincy Adams was involved in. It was put out by the National Day of Prayer. I hope you all come tonight. It's a short film. It's only about 35 minutes long. But we had some Christian founders in our country who stood for biblical truth. I hope you can be here. Well, let me get back to Galatians for a second because that's our second passage that we're paralleling today here. Galatians gives us some of the overarching principles of true Christian liberty, what it is and what it is not. And so it's with grateful thanksgiving that we as United States uh, citizens can look back at 1776. But the principles of liberty also apply to the spiritual realm. Stand fast, this is Galatians 5, beginning in verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, you're fallen from grace. For the way through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? For, brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But if ye be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Galatians 5 is a text that deals with people who are truly free versus people who are under the heavy hand of sin, who are under the oppressive hand of legalism, who are enslaved trying to earn salvation or sanctification by works of the law. Paul gives us the illustration of circumcision here, but uses it to establish the primary principal boundaries of true Christian liberty. He uses three sets of contrary systems to do this, and then ends by contrasting the works of the flesh with the fruit of the Spirit at the end of Galatians chapter 5. The first contrast that he offers for our consideration is the flesh versus the Spirit. That's a contrast between the two principal empowerments that struggle for supremacy in the Christian life and our pursuit of freedom. First thing is empowerments. If you're taking notes, write these down. First contrast that Paul gives in Galatians 5 is flesh versus spirit, a contrast between the two principal empowerments that struggle for supremacy in the Christian life in our pursuit of freedom. The second contrast that Paul gives us for our consideration is works versus faith. That's a contrast between the two principal means. There's your key word, means, that people follow in their pursuit of salvation or sanctification. That's the second contrast, works versus faith, the means of salvation or sanctification. The third set of contrasts that Paul hammers out is law versus grace or law versus love. The grace-love is together. That's the contrast between the two principal motivations, motivations that people follow in their desire to be justified and sanctified. So you've got the empowerments, there's a contrast. You've got the means, there's a contrast. You've got the motivations, there's a contrast. Then he gives the capstone, the result of what will happen if you try to follow the flesh, human good works, and the law of Moses. It only results in works of the flesh. Then, as his capstone on the other side, the results of what will happen if you come under the control of the Holy Spirit. If you walk by faith, if you manifest grace and love, it always results in the fruit of the Spirit. Herein lies true Christian liberty, true freedom, not merely political freedom, though we celebrate that today, but it's our political freedom that has given us the right to practice our Christian freedom without fear. We couldn't gather like this in North Korea. We would all be arrested and sent to concentration camps, and I would probably be killed within 24 hours. We thank God for the political liberty that we have. 
But the real liberty, the Christian liberty that we have, comes from God himself. True Christian liberty is not a right. True Christian liberty is an empowerment that makes us free from the bondage of sin and death. Now, I hope some of you can quote this with me because you've heard me say this probably a hundred times over the last 11 years that I've been here. True Christian liberty is not the right to do what you want. Christian liberty is the empowerment to do what we ought. Not what we want, but what we ought. Christians have no rights that we can demand from God. We turned all our rights over to him when we trusted in Jesus Christ. After salvation, all of our so-called rights are now subject to the will of God as revealed in the word of God. And that is where we find true freedom and only where we find true freedom. We are only free when we are doing what God designed for us to do. We are not free when we are enslaved by sin. We are not free when we are indulging the flesh with wickedness. We are not free when we believe the lies of the devil and destroy our lives. We are not free when we're walking according to the course of this world. Our freedom comes when we allow the Spirit of God to lift us up above the filth of the world, just as the power of the fuel and the engines lifts the multi-ton airplane above the surface of the earth. Every time I walk across the courtyard here at the church, I see airplanes coming in for their landings at the Philadelphia airport. And I always marvel that that gigantic mass of tons of steel can hover in air above the church and land safely with hundreds of passengers on board. There's a power that God has designed into the atmosphere so that when the wings are shaped just a certain way and the fuselage is shaped just a certain way and the tail is shaped just a certain way actually lifts that thing off the ground and keeps it hovering above the earth where nothing interferes with it and where it can land safely in another location, sometimes all the way around the world. That's what true Christian liberty does for you. It doesn't chain you to earth and tell you you're free. It doesn't chain you in the bottom of a cesspool and tell you you're free to splash around. Christian liberty lifts you up above the chains of earth. Christian liberty is given to you when the power of the Spirit of God comes upon you and you do those things that glorify God. When we're empowered by the Holy Spirit, when we're obedient to the Word of God, the Holy Spirit never motivates us or empowers us to violate the Word of God. Every time we disobey the Bible, we are walking in the flesh. Disobedience to the Bible is not Christian liberty. That is the definition of truly good works. Good works are not a matter of keeping the law of Moses in the power of the flesh to the glory of the Pharisee who does them. Certainly they are no good works which violate the principles of the word of God even though the world may view them as good works. For example, there are some people who are, and we have missionaries here who have spoken on this, working among the poor in third world countries. Many of those children die from starvation. That missionary commented that the solution these poor people needed was training in family planning and birth control. She said that would solve their problems. No. That's the solution offered by the world, the flesh, and the devil. And all three will say a hearty amen to the words of the missionary. The world, the flesh, and the devil will say amen. You see, birth control uses abortifacient drugs, and that is not a glorious substitute for letting babies starve to death. That's not how you solve the problem, by killing them. We need to start thinking like Christians if we want to experience true Christian liberty. Just because the world, the flesh, or the devil says that you have freedom to do something does not make it so. Legalism never brings liberty. Immoral license never brings liberty either. Libertinism brings you into bondage just as swiftly as legalism. Both legalism and libertinism are both your deadly enemies. Both legalism and libertinism are both the enemies of your true freedom in Christ. That's Paul's theme 
in Galatians. Legalism not merely the establishment of boundaries for right and wrong. God has established boundaries for right and wrong in his word. But our spiritual enemies have tried to do two things. Number one, blur the boundaries. Number two, redefine the terms. These are the two areas where you have to be alert in spiritual battle. The legalist wants to move the boundaries to require more than God requires in some areas. The libertine wants to remove the boundaries to require less than God requires in some areas. Praise God for those three court decisions this month. They were trying to remove some boundaries so that some people would have freedom of expression to do all kinds of horrible immoral things. And they were trying to curtail freedoms of Christians to stand by their consciences and to express themselves freely. Praise God that he moved our Supreme Court to give the Christians victory in those three cases. Both try to redefine the terms of the conflict so that either you must defend ground that God has not called you to defend or you fail to defend ground that God requires you to defend. You've heard me preach on legalism, so I'll not preach another message on that. But you do need to realize that the freedom we have in Christ in this country is the foundation for the freedom that we experience politically in this country. Remember the contrast where we began? First contrast, flesh versus the spirit, the two principal empowerments, the struggle for supremacy in the Christian life. Second contrast, works versus faith, the principal means that people follow in their pursuit of salvation or sanctification. The third set of contrasts, law versus grace and love, between the two principal motivations that people follow in their desire to be justified and sanctified. When you were born in the United States, you were freeborn. When you were born again, when you were born into the kingdom of God, you were freeborn. The devil's going to try to use the law to violate your freedom in Christ, just like he tries to use political pressure and political laws to violate your freedom in this country. The devil will use lasciviousness, if possible, and a loose view of Christian liberty to violate your freedom in Christ because he puts you back in bondage when that happens. Just like the devil will try to violate your Christian consciences by promoting the immoral lifestyles that we see in our country today while restricting your ability to preach against them or to stand against them. With great sum obtained I this freedom, said the chief captain. But, said Paul, I was free born. If you're a believer in Christ, you were free born, born free. And now you have the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. You have the means and the motivation so that by the grace of God, you might fly above the world and that you might show to all true freedom in Christ. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for your word and for its power. We thank you that you have made us freeborn. We do thank you, Father, for the political freedom in our country because that's what gives us the right to express our spiritual freedom openly and publicly and without shame, without having to backpedal, without excuse. So, Father, we thank you for the men and women who stood firm in this country during the War of Independence so that their children might be freeborn. We thank you, Father, for the day that you heard us or caused us to hear the gospel of Christ the empowerment of your Holy Spirit who opened our hearts and our eyes to understand it and who gave us faith so that we also in the spiritual realm might be freeborn. We praise you, Father. We thank you. For you are the God of life, liberty, and true happiness because of freedom in Christ. 
We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.